Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third panel of our conference today, which will focus on the theme of objects. And we will start with uh, Professor, Professor Belgin Turan Özkaya. I will not introduce her as Daniel introduced her in the morning. Uh, today, she will uh, talk about uh, lost objects, untold stories, uh, Mesopotamia around 1855. Oh, thank you, Gizam. Can I take the other side? Okay, I will wait for the images. In the meantime, uh, perhaps I can say a couple of things. Um, well, what I'm presenting today is very much a, not even a work in progress, but a research in progress. So even the research is not uh, finished yet. So I'm open to any kind of uh, suggestions, uh, especially in terms of the leads that I can uh, follow uh, from now on. Uh, so uh, as you will see, I don't really have much uh, conclusions. Uh, and it is quite a descriptive text, okay. I'm warning you. Uh, it's more like a story, actually, uh, that uh, kind of captured me uh, for a while uh, by now. Uh, so I think we can start now in order to use my time economically. I will just uh, read. I hope you can hear me. Sometimes my voice is not uh, high enough, uh, I realize. Uh, ah, it's not working. Here we go. Uh, hundreds of animal clothes, almost intact with their corners, and tied to girders with ropes, are drawn by architect Felix Thoma with remarkable fastidiousness in Mimir and Asiri, Victor Plas's belated 1867 account of his explorations in northern Mesopotamia. Accompanied on two sides by orthographic drawings on a single pebble and that of an animal float, the drawing illustrates what Plas calls a modern planet. Above the plan, I think we can. Main. Draw. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, above the plan, Thomas drew eight traps floating down the tigers with their three colored flags, allegedly given to class by the Pasha of Musul in an orderly and effortless manner. Their precious cargo, I think, perhaps we can go. In the beginning, I have many images done <laughs> uh, as much. Uh, their precious cargo included two 32 uh, uh, ton wind bulls and 13 ton bass fleas from one of the city gates in Korsova. In another, in another Thomas, I think we can go back just for a second, and then perhaps now forward in order to get them. Okay. Um, in another Thomas scene, we see the arduous dragging of one of the colossal Momasu on an Araba along a partially paved track with none other than ancient Assyrian bricks by 600 men, mostly Nestorians and Jabu Arabs, whom Plus claims to have stimulated by putting musicians in front of the procession and adds, I quote, a strike on blacks in America, end quote. Plus have excavated more than 9,000 uh, 9, square meters that amounted no less than 78 rooms 131 doors, four large corridors, and eight internal courtyards in Korsovac. Considering that Paul Emil Botta, who was credited with the much celebrated discovery of Minova by the French, could unearth only 14 rooms, 14 rooms, 28 doors, and four books, the extent of Plus's operation can be envisaged. Yet, in May 1855, Plus's modern telex, with the exception of two, and the rented sailing boat, carrying hundreds of cases of ancient artifacts, including the colossal Lamassu, carried to Musul with such difficulty, 86 cases of Plus's personal objects, 41 cases from the Babylonian excavations, and eight other cases destined to Berlin, sank at Kurma, close to their destination in Basra to be shipped to Europe. No less than 207 cases of its Paris and Berlin bound load disappeared at the confluence of, of the Tigris and Euphrates, leaving the exact circumstances of the shipwreck unclear. This massive failure of 19th century archaeology 
does not seem to find much place in related literature. Even in the recent, less Eurocentric, is that Eurocentric and critical scholarship on European attitudes towards Assyrian antiquity, it's mentioned in passing and simplistically typed a failure to, be, to pay a bribe to local tribes. Frederick Bohr, for instance, in his otherwise meticulously researched Orientalism and Usual Culture, imagining Mesopotamia in 19th century Europe, quite laconically writes, quote, in May 1855, for failure to pay an expected bribe, rats were capsized, end quote without elaborating much on the local circumstances. Gordon Larson, on the other hand, who reserves a whole section for the shipwreck, questioning classes all at time, still cannot help but underline that, quote, an Ottoman naval ship watched the whole affair without intervening, end quote. The by and large overlooked incident, on the other hand, provides a unique opportunity to trace the, the hitherto unexplored antiquarian ambitions in the territorializing and modernizing Ottoman Empire in the 50s Iraq as the backdrop of a precarious balance between diverse local groups, including Arabs, Berbers, Bedouins, Fellas, Kurds, Turkomans, Nestorians, Jacobites, Chaldeans, Yazidis, and Jews, to name a few, and the Europeans, particularly the French and the British. Interestingly, the burgeoning literature on Ottoman engagement with antiquity and the recent critical histories of archaeology do not quench, leaving the glaring absence of Ottoman and local agency intact in general histories of archaeology. What was the Ottoman response to the antiquarian activities of the French and the British in 1850s Iraq? Did they develop strategies of negotiation and control? Did they engage in similar activities themselves? What were their mechanisms of engagement and resistance? It's curious that Victor Plus, who was in Mosul in consular capacity, a post that required an in-depth recognition of the context political dynamics in the region, is quite terse when he writes about the incident. In his two-page account, the loss of a part of the antiquities within the 600-page Nunim el he states that he does not want to blame anyone and brings up his personal loss. Yet all these he eventually confesses were not important in the face of, quote, those irreplaceable pieces lost as the consequence of the disaster, end quote, without specifying which pieces he is referring to. As a matter of fact, in this day, an accurate record of what were lost has not been surfaced. In the Ottoman archives, however, we find some other accounts, the impartiality of which needs to be contested, contested needless to say, thanks to an investigation conducted by the Sublime Court upon the complaints of Monsieur Klaman, to whom the transport of the antiquities from Baghdad to Basra was entrusted by Plus. Apparently, after the shipwreck, Klaman, a language teacher from Baghdad, claimed that they were assured about their safety by local authorities before departure. Based on testimonies by the accountant of Iraqi and Hijaz army, Mehmet Halis, who was the temporary governor in Baghdad at the absence of Mehmet Reşit Pasha, other officers of the army, and more importantly, the, the French consul, Ashin Murat, uh, the, after the verdict, the verdict was the responsibility had belonged to Victor Plas, who impatiently decided to send the fleet with antiquities to Basra with, uh, via the Tigris. Uh, despite all the warnings about the security problems on that particular stretch of the river, especially the letter perfectly written and forwarded to Ashin Murad and Plus himself by Kaimakam Suvari Mehmet Shafiq and Babil Arab Mehmet Murad on the 9th of May before the departure of antiquities, Reporting the unsafe situation was presented as the proof of the warnings. The commandant of the Iraqi and Hijaz army, the governor of Baghdad, Mehmet, Baghdad, Mehmet Reşit Pasha, was away in the vicinity of Hila, trying to appease the revolt by the Muntafik tribe, one of the biggest conglomerations of central Iraqi tribes around Basra. 
The dating system is the population of Iraq combined large Kurdish families in the north and large tribes of Arabs, Berbers, and Bedouins in the south who might be city dwellers, peasants, or semi-nomads and <coughs> nomads. The Ottomans instigated a direct rule by abolishing the centuries-old semi-autonomy only after the 1830s. Their centralizing ambitions along the lines of the new reordering state seem to have been resisted on different uh, levels. For instance, after the death of Fakht in 1848, the strife between the Sheikhs Paris and Mansur over the Meshihat, the leadership of the Wim Tarfaks, lasted almost four years, with authority changing hands intermittently, while the Ottoman officials' interference and appointment of rival Sheikhs alternately arguably did not ameliorate the situation. A couple of years after that, in May 1855, there was a struggle going on between the Ottoman provincial government and the Muntafik tribe, which de facto threatens the agreement about the security of the region, which was supposed to be maintained by the tribe during peace time. During peace time. What is not clear in Plus's account is the fact that between the arrival of packed cages of antiquities in December 1853 from Korsoba, some of which, as we have seen, were dragged with great difficulty along an arduously constructed path and they were sailing down the Tigris on Kelex uh, for Basra via Baghdad. In April 1855, more than a year passed, while a ship for the precious cargo that would be arranged by the French Ministry of Finance was waiting on. Premium war between the Russian Empire and the alliance of the French, British, and the Ottomans had started a little while ago, and the French Navy was busy. Finally, the ministry hired a private ship, which was supposed to make the journey from Europe to Basra in, uh, in four months, I think perhaps we can pass, rather than the usual six, as the previous canal era that required going around Africa, making its state of arrival uncertain. Add to that, the order banning Plus to go beyond Baghdad and forcing him to relocate to his new post, his hands seem to have been tied. Furthermore, according to Mehmet Halis, M. Klaman and his translator agreed to take 300,000 Kush worth of merchandise with them to Basra on the sailing boat hired by the British commander in Baghdad for the French to sail. Captain Jones would make them unload the letter before the boat took off, but an hour away from Baghdad, all were reloaded, rendering the boat, which was already damaged during the placing of the life stones, even heavier, and leading to the exposure of valuable merchandise to the urban, urban ishkiasa in the area. Due to the Aditi Kagimei Arab at Mehmet Ha'is, they regarded the material wasted and as such their own, giving them the right to move them. Uh, Interestingly, in November 1853, around the time class with his crowded crew was dragging the colossal Lomasu from Kosovo to Mosul, the governor general of Mosul, Mehmet Hilmi Pasha, wrote to the sublime court, reminding the terms of the permit given to class about the sharing of dupli duplicate fines and complaining about not being notified of even a single fine although the French consul by then already had some sculpture-like pictures, large objects, and various antiquities at his possession. He warned that the consul was preparing to send two curious colossal sculptures, Eyakili Ajide ve Cessime iki adet mermertaj, to France, quote, to be placed on the gates of the French emperor's palace, end quote. This was exactly around the same time when British envoy Stratford Canning upon applying for a permission to excavate on the Aegean island of Colinos in the name of Charles Newton, was asked to share the duplicate finds with the governor general of the Aegean islands. Earlier in 1850, when Austin Henry Laird applied for permission to resume excavations in Mosul and export his findings, intentions to ban the exportation of antiquities were revealed on the part of the Sublime Court. Ahmed Fethi Pasha, the Grand Master of the Artillery, who in 1846 had organized a collection of antiquities, Mejmaya Asal Artika, alongside antique weapons and ancient Janissary costumes in the former Jebehane on the top of the palace grounds, wrote, quote, randomly chosen people have been exporting antiquities which have a position like a spiritual key to human history. 
and this situation is inappropriate and does not fit the glorious Ottoman Empire. Therefore, it must be forbidden completely. The preparation of regulations designed to secure such antiquities for the Imperial Museum is already in hand. Apparently, the Mikra Pasha's interest was not limited to collecting the Ottoman share of others' finds. Sometime before in January, he had asked permission to purchase the house of Taha the blacksmith and others nearby at Minova to excavate there. A monolith had been found in the area, which turned out to be one of the human headed bulls, like those found at Korsabad and Korinjo, in Hermes Ressam's work, in, in Hermes Ressam's words. From another letter of Pasha, we learned that in January 1853, the Ottoman government decided to take charge of the excavations around Mosul itself and not to renew the permissions granted to French and British excavators when they expired. A doctor, Mehmet Murat Efendi, was asked to survey all the Mosul sites, who apparently concluded that many things would be uncovered at the end of such excavations and added that he would prepare a map of the premises. Next year in April 1854, when a restricted excavation permission was for six months was given to William Kenneth Loftus in parts of Mosul, excluding Minova, Nimrud, and Korsobar, it was emphasized that the letter were to be reserved to Ottoman officials so that all the future finds that might be that might be amassed by the Ottoman government. But if we go back to 1853 in fall, when Hermes Ressam, the protege of Austin Henry Lair, fresh from, 18, from an 18 month training at Oxford, arrived in Mosul, his hometown, was surprised to find out that the local authorities were excavating at the mound of Nabi Yunus in Minova. Ressam was from a prominent Calvin family of Mosul and employed uh, by Lair in his excavations alongside his brother Christian Ressam, who also operated as the British consul. For Rassam, the Ottoman claim to antiquities was quite unexpected and unwanted. He writes about how Victor Plus asked Himi Pasha's help for persuading the owner of the property at Nebi Yunus for excavations on his land, only to be told, quote, that the Ottoman government was as much in want of antiquities as the French and English were, end quote. Although Rassam interpreted Himi Pasha's interest in antiquities more like a treasure hunt, like the Reshap Pasha of uh, Elman, I think. Uh, since the establishment of Mejmai Asada Tita, the central Ottoman government was urging provincial authorities to seek out antiquities and send the valuable among what they found to Istanbul. Most probably, some depots were also established for keeping such objects. Some provincial governors had already undertaken such explorations in Thessaly to Halai Gaza and Aleppo and sent objects to the newly formed Mejma. Hilmi Pasha apparently, without losing time, sent the chief of police to the spot with many convicts as workers to explore the ruin. Rassam is quite dismissive of Hilmi Pasha's endeavors. He writes about the slowness and unsystematicity of the search and the workers' lack of aptitude. Despite all the inadequacy and the necessity to purchase the land from owners, Due to the established rules requiring considerable funds, the exploration evidently did not stop as a short adventure and extended over approximately a nine month period during which Hilmi Pasha tried hard to enlist Rassam's help asking for a skilled laborer from his crew. Tactfully, Hilmi Pasha was seeking collaboration. He would allow Rassam to visit the excavation and copy the farm inscription inscriptions, which Rassam would send to the British resident in Bada and the Romans for the settlement. Beginning in the 1850s and later with the 1874 regulations, Ottoman authorities seem to have taken the agreement to share antiquities with foreign explorers, explorers seriously and have been quite eager to collaborate, as the case of the Nipasha demonstrates, who was pressuring Victor Plus to submit the copybook Mubein Defteri and the Ottoman share of the fines while showing the fruits of his excavation to his British rivals. Against all odds, Hilmi Pasha managed to find some Hayati Arji Bebe, Jessina Marbles himself. Through Lamassu, with accompanying gigantic Gilgamesh figures holding a lion under one arm, arguably not very different than the one sunk at Puna on their way to Europe, 
a chamber cladded with orthostats containing a short inscription of a Hidden, a bronze lion and an inscribed marble tablet Rastampo's Nidilinus inscription of Senatri. Now, by way of conclusion, what can be said? By zooming in on a mere footnote, even in recent literature critical of the trajectories of modern archaeology, the hitherto unexplored Ottoman perspective can be cited. Already in the 1850s, the central Ottoman government was developing strategies of negotiation in an attempt to interfere in the European antiquarian odyssey on its lands. That included regulation, collaboration, and direct engagement, among others. This is different than how it is seen in the literature of Ottoman engagement with antiquity, which foregrounds the Hamidian era and the towering figure of Osman Hamdi as major protagonists. I contend that such an inquiry offers a layered and inclusive history of the mobilization of archaeological artifacts in the 19th century. Also, by highlighting some marbles that departed but never arrived, it also offers an alternative historical trajectory based on losses and damages in contradistinction to conventional histories of 19th century archaeology that are written by and large from the point of view of successes and accomplishments. Thank you. Brilliant, really nice. Thank you, Raidin Ocam. Uh, just before I introduce the uh, second speaker, I would like to um, warn our audience that please, if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A uh, section, and we will um, come to the questions later at the end of the panel. So uh, our next, next speaker is uh, Nilay Özlü. Uh, Nilay Özlü is an architectural historian with a focus on the urban culture of Istanbul, late Ottoman history, and museum studies. Her co-edited volume, The City in the Muslim World, was published by Rutledge. Özlü was the Barakat Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Oxford and the Shivening Visiting Fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. And currently, she is an assistant professor at Istanbul Big University, teaching architectural design, history, and theory. The title of her paper is Treasures in Motion, the display of the Topkapı Palace collections during the 19th century. Uh, floor is yours, Nila. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gizem, and thank you so much for this joint organization. So let me start with sharing my uh, screen. I'll... Okay, I hope it is... I hope you can all see it. Um, so today I'll, I'll be focusing on the mobility of objects rather than people, and I'll focus on the objects that are uh, perceived more or less stable and immobile. So I'll try to uh, deconstruct this perspe perspective and scrutinize the mobility of Ottoman imperial treasury collections, especially during the 19th uh, century. Um, Okay, French gem merchant and traveler Jean Baptiste Tavernier, who visited Constantinople during the late 17th century, wrote a volume depicting the Serai of the Grand Seigneur. According to Tavernier, the Ottoman treasury was, quote, like the Caspian Sea, always being fed by many rivers, but never let anything go out emphasizing its ever-increasing wealth and legendary prosperity, he also emphasized the one-way flow of the treasures and their immobility in the Ottoman context. In a similar manner, Gudrun Ejipolo states that, quote, the carefully preserved personal belongings of each sultan, venerated by every subsequent ruler when he acceded, acceded to the throne, turned the treasury into a sort of family museum celebrating Ottoman dynastic continuity. It is true that the Ottoman treasury has been enriched through myriad ways, such as wars, lootings, gifts, and acquisitions throughout centuries. The accumulation of the treasury within centuries was well documented through treasury registers and gift registers, etc. Um, yet, as opposed to Tavernier's proposition, Ottoman treasures were in constant circulation within the Ottoman context. Many items of tangible or intangible value was ordered from the treasury on the occasion of royal weddings, 
births, military cam campaigns, sword girding ceremonies, bayram greetings, enthronement ceremonies, or royal celebrations and festivals. In the treasury registers, it is also documented that objects from the imperial treasury also circulated within the various kiosks, library, and treasures of the Topka Palace as well. Moreover, numerous treasury items, including books, china, exotic objects, and antique arms and armor, and many others, uh, as well as jewelry, were also sent to various imperial palaces as the Ottoman imperial household started residing at palaces other than the Topka Palace. For example, we know that a great deal of objects were transferred to the Yildiz Palace during the reign of Abdulhamid II. Um, another turning point also took place during the mid 19th century. Following the trends in rivaling European and Russian monarchies, the Ottoman household started displaying their treasures for distinguished, distinguished uh, foreign visitors. Uh, during the time of Abdul Mejid, especially based on the amicable atmosphere created with the Ottoman alliance with European powers during the Crimean War, Topka Palace was opened for visits, so did the first chamber of the treasury. And by the time of Abdulaziz, the practice for visiting the treasury became quite common and two more chambers were organized for the display of the treasury. Custom display cabinets were ordered during this era. By the end of, the on, end of his reign, there were approximately 4,800 objects on display. Almost everything that had some sort of tangible or intangible value for Ottoman rulers were stored and displayed in the treasury from jewelry to thrones, costumes to cups, coins to paintings, cloaks to china, fabrics to parchments, arms and armors, gifts, boxes, glassware, etc. Basically, anything of value were densely organized in the treasury chambers, shown to visitors in display cabinets, creating a sense of richness and prosperity through accumulation. Um, it was also during the time of Abdulaziz, the Ottoman treasures attained certain nobility and a selection of imperial treasures left the dens of the Topka Palace, perhaps for the first time for display purposes. Abdulaziz, being aware of the leg legitimizing and majestic impact of the dynastic patrimony and imperial collections, ordered the display of the pieces from the imperial treasury at the Ottoman General Exposition, Sergi Umumi Osmani, that was organized in Istanbul in 1863. The National Exposition was of quite, uh, was of quite significance for the Ottomans and especially for Abdulaziz, who personally attended its inauguration in which thousands of objects from all around the empire, as well as international goods were exhibited. Some handpicked 60 valuable jewelry pieces from the Imperial Treasury collection were brought from the Topka Palace and displayed publicly. According to Mirat newspaper, these invaluable pieces were sent back to the Topka Palace each evening and brought back to the exhibition hall during the course of the exhibition. According to L'Exposition Nationale, Coupe d'Olay, two large emeralds, nine brooches with diamonds, earrings, bracelets, three jeweled aigrettes, mirrors and pendants, jugs and drawers made of rock crystal and adorned with rubies and diamonds, as well as ancient weapons such as eight jeweled daggers, two swords, kivers were displayed in a special pavilion during the Ottoman National Exposition. The exhibition hall, designed by the French architect Auguste Bourgeois and decorated by Léon Parvier, was built in the Hippodrome, or Sultan Ahmed Meydanı, at the heart of the historic city. Pietro Montani designed an additional building known as the Imperial Chamber, Dairi Humayun, which was attached to the main exhibition space. I suggest that this polygonal pavilion, raised from the ground and including two guard rooms, might have housed the treasury collection during the Ottoman National Exposition. Yet, after their display in Istanbul for the National Ex Exposition, a decade later, the Ottoman government took another bold decision and decided to send a selection of treasures to Vienna World's Fair, which was held in 1873. Apart from a real-size replica of the Fountain of Ahmed III, a Turkish house, a bathhouse, a coffee house, a Turkish bazaar and a mosque uh, whose form was derived from the early Ottoman mosques in Bursa, 
the Ottoman Commission decided to display the legendary riches of the Ottoman dynasty in Vienna. Built for the display of the items sent from the Ottoman treasury, Hazini Hassa, or the Sultan's treasury, was designed by Ottoman Levantine architect and painter Pietro Montani and included approximately 200 original objects brought from the Topka Palace in Istanbul. Esposione Universale di Vienna Illustrata underscores the significance of this collection with these lines, quote, Everything that what one could imagine about the fabulous riches of the great emperor, everything that one reads in the tales of the Thousand and One Nights and that makes them so fantastic and attractive is exposed to the gaze of all." End quote. The Ottomans put great emphasis on Windbelt Ausstellung uh, that would take place in the capital of their long standing rival. Sultan Abdulaziz, personally witnessing the international exhibition's economic and political impact during his visit to the Paris L'Exposition Universelle, uh, paid particular attention to the Vienna World's Fair. Against the financial struggles, the Ottomans' participation in Vienna was quite assertive. Preparations started as early as 1871 under the supervision of the Minister of Public Works, Ibrahim Etan Pasha, his son Osman Hamdi, Levantine architect Pietro Montani, French intellectual Victor Marie Deliné, and Ottoman bureaucrat Mehmet Shevki Efendi were appointed to the exhibition commission and took part in the publication of three semi-academic volumes on Ottoman architecture, the sartorial culture of the empire, and the history of Istanbul. An Ottoman neighborhood was also built in the oriental section of the Prater, as Ahmet Arsoy has already um, depicted and studied in detail. Uh, so I'll focus on the Sultan's treasury, which was designed by Pietro Montani. I think it was one of the most interesting buildings in the Ottoman neighborhood, because unlike other pavilions on display, which were made of temporary materials such as papier-mâché, cardboard or plaster, the treasure house was built of permanent materials such as stone and cast iron, most probably to secure the priceless collection. Montani, also known as a painter and decorator in, in Istanbul, was responsible for the design of several other pavilions in Vienna, including the replica of the Fountain of Ahmed III and the Cir uh, Circle Oriental, an eclectic pavilion built on the Oriental section of the exposition, representing the geography, culture, economy and industry of the Orient. When we have a closer look at the treasury pavilion, we can see that its architectural elements were derived from Usul or L'Architecture Ottoman, which was also displayed in, uh, in Vienna. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go through the details of this dialogue between theory and practice, but I just wanted to mention it here. A document dated 1872 details the cost of the books, Usuli Mimari and ABC Osmani, eh? and a special kiosk that would be constructed to keep the treasury collection. Therefore, I assume that these were the two, uh, three most expensive uh, pieces uh, prepared for Vienna, uh, World's Fair. A register from the Topka Palace archive provides a list of the treasury items to be sent from Istanbul to Vienna. And according to, the, to this Deftar dated 1873, Ottoman government sent around 200 treasury objects Moreover, it's particularly mentioned that an ancient armor preserved in the tomb of Mehmet II was also sent to the World's Fair with the order of Etab Pasha. According to, the, to this register, 15 mugs, 13 pitchers, 26 plates, 8 daggers, 6 clocks, 5 cases, 4 flasks, and numerous objects made of gold or rock crystal and richly adorned with emeralds, diamonds, and rubies were displayed as finest representations of Ottoman arts and crafts. A large portion of the display was dedicated to precious weapons and ancient military gear as well, manifesting their superiority in the arts of war and perhaps as a distant reminder of their siege of this very city, the Ottoman government sent six armors, seven helmets, 23 swords, 18 rifles, six pistols, four bows, bows and arrows, as well as shields, saddles, maces, etc., to Vienna. The selection of objects, apart from manifesting uh, glory and artistic refinement of the Ottoman Empire, they were also significant for their historical value and workmanship.
I'm sorry. Um, and even though it was not mentioned in the register, contemporary newspapers informs us that the throne of Nadir Shah, which was given to Ottomans as a gift during the 18th century, was also sent to Vienna and displayed as the centerpiece of the ex exhibition. It must, have been as the, it must have been a last minute decision to include this opponent piece in the display, perhaps after seeing the ambitious designs of the Egyptian neighborhood uh, with its rising minarets in the, in the Prater. Uh, inauguration of the pavilion was delayed for two months due to the financial and technical problems, and the collection was kept in the treasure chamber of the Hofburg Palace during this period. The color of the pavilion has changed three times before its opening, and finally the inauguration ceremony was held on July the 9th, 1873. Austrian press celebrated the opening of the long-awaited pavilion and the richness and beauty of the treasury collection with, with admiration. An article from the Fremdenblatt emphasized that this rich collection was just a small portion of the actual treasury kept in the Imperial Palace in Istanbul. An article titled The Sultan's Treasure published um, at the Times mentioned that the Ottoman treasury was finally opened after a delay and gave a detailed depiction of the items on display, which included the throne of Nadir Shah, as well as chain armor owned by Murat I and his Persian helmet. The author referred to the difficulty of seeing these valuable objects in the Topka Palace and celebrated their display of the, in Vienna with these words, quote, it is not many years since even the most powerful protection could not procure you access to see the treasury of the Ottoman sultans in the old Seraglio. It was jealously guarded from the eyes of the stranger as their, um, sorry, as their jealousy is not confined to the treasury, but extended even to such harmless things, such as the library, not to speak of the archives. Under these circumstances, the sending of a portion of the imperial treasure to the exhibition and their exposing it to the gaze of the multitude was considerable concession to the spirit of the age." End quote. Even though the Sultan's treasury attracted much attention from the visitors, there were complaints about the limited number of days it was kept open. Following, to the, following the procedures of display in the Topka Palace, Ottoman officials decided to keep the treasury open three days of the week, only for three hours in Vienna. A separate ticket was needed to have access to the collection as well. The small size of the pavilion with respect to the large number of visitors and the manner of the guards were also subject to criticism. Eventually, the Ottomans decided to keep the treasury open for visits every day. The correspondence between Ottoman officials um, proves that the developments taking place in Vienna were reported to Istanbul minutely. Osman Hamdi, as the head commissioner of the exhibition, was reporting directly to the ambassadors, uh, ambassador to Vienna, Kabuli Pasha, and Kabuli Pasha was informing to Beşit Pasha. And inauguration of the Hazine Hassa was reported to Istanbul government in detail. The emperor of Austria attended the opening ceremony and expressed his appreciation for the elegance and good taste of the construction. The letter of Osman Hamdi confirmed that, quote, the emperor seemed really interested in examining the precious objects contained in the windows of the imperial treasury, and in particular, he was occupied with the fine arms, many of which belong to our illustrious sovereigns. To, com uh, to conclude, to sum up, after they returned to Istanbul, the reputation and fame of the Ottoman treasures expanded globally, and both the Topka Palace and the imperial treasures became a touristic hotspot for the foreign tourists visiting Constantinople from all around the world. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the imperial treasury continued attracting an ever increasing number of visitors and took part in the dissemination and circulation of the Ottoman cultural and imperial legacy. And the palace itself became a route for the circulation of visitors, which was finalized at the much appreciated and anticipated imperial treasury, as you can see in this route. So thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Nilay, for this fascinating paper. Uh, and again, our audience, please write down your questions if you have any to any of our speakers in the Q&A uh, section. 
we will come to those questions at the end of our panel. So uh, the last speaker is uh, Roxanne Goldberg and she's, hello Roxanne, she's joining us from uh, uh, the States, good morning. Um, so Roxanne is a doctoral candidate in history, theory, criticism of art and Ahan program for Islamic architecture at MIT. Her dissertation, Selling and Salvaging the Orient, U.S. Circuits of Islamic Art, 1870 to 1840, straight, straight the U.S. circulation of Islamic art within religious histories and design discourses, and examines how American engagement with Islamic art contribute to, contributed to negotiations of American identity in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. The title of her talk today is Ottoman Mobilities and the Early 20th Century Market for Islamic Art and Antiquities. Floor is your Roxanne. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so before I begin, I just want to thank Dr. Uskaya and Dr. Haruz for your now multi-year efforts to organize this very exciting panel for the EAUH conference, and especially making it possible for all of us to present in this workshop format today. I also wanna thank my co-panelists. I'm already very quite inspired by uh, Dr. Uskaya's uh, suggestion of an alternative historical trajectory written from the point of view of failures and losses. Um, there's some themes that will resonate with my own work. And I'm also quite excited about Dr. Oslu's um, discussion about the constant circulation of objects, another uh, theme that will resonate with my paper today. So the title of my paper today is Loans, Looms, and Liquidation, Ottoman Mobilities and the Early 20th Century Market for Islamic Art and Antiquities. The decades bracketing the turn of the 20th century was a period of change in the commercial life of the United States. In the aftermath of the Civil War, power consolidated within a new bourgeois class of industrialists, bankers, and real estate speculators found by the accumulation of capital, setting themselves apart from a working class that included artisans who worked with their hands and merchants who manned their own shops. This new economic class was further united by a shared culture that emphasized rationality, discipline, and individual liberty, values which the entrepreneurial elite sought to inject into commercial institutions shaping urban life, museums, and department stores. As the relationship between consumers and commercial goods underwent this period of change, so too did the ways of doing business. American cultural historian William Leach has used the term broker class to describe the interior designers, admin, curators, and other intermediaries who circulated among institutions, inflating desire and shaping a culture of consumer capitalism. But as American historian Richard White has explained, the change in markets and market relations was not a wholesale replacement. It was a process of layering markets and knitting them together, often through cultures of trust. In this paper, I demonstrate that networks of Ottoman makers and purveyors of art and antiquities were participants in the struggle for economic power and cultural influence in the turn of the century United States. As members of the broker class, mobile Ottomans selectively dialed up and down the Oriental, Ottoman and ethnic affiliations for social and political, as well as financial reasons. As I will show, these various identity markers were entangled with notions of individualized and localized expertise that challenged centralized urban institutions run by the American bourgeoisie, including museums. This paper focuses on a microhistorical drama that occurred at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York between 1905 and 1911. It centers on a single object and includes a cast of historical actors who we might group into two categories, curators, directors, and a lawyer affiliated with the Met, and the network of mobile Ottomans encompassing dealers in Istanbul and New York, a banker with ties to Manchester, and a textile maker and restorer. For around two years, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York displayed a rug measuring five feet, four inches 
by three feet, seven inches. The textile contained multiple bands of calligraphy, loose swirling vegetal and floral designs, and a central panel with a rounded niche. The only surviving photograph does not record its color, but a type description catalogs a large cream colored border, a green inner border, gold thread, and a ground of quote, Isfahan red with clouds of various colors of the happiest harmony, end quote. The carpet likely hung in an exhibition room alongside other textiles or perhaps three-dimensional objects designated decorative arts. At the time of its display, it was one of only a few oriental rugs in the Met's collection of Islamic textiles, a new and then largely unexplored collecting interest of the New York institution. In October 1908, when this very rug was on view, the Met published an article in its bulletin announcing that collecting, quote, ancient rugs has become a duty, end quote. In that short essay, the authoritative voice of the museum legitimated this new mission by giving credit to the wealthy New York patrons reading the bulletin. Inside the Met, however, textiles from the Islamic world were being introduced to the museum through a very different social network rooted in the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman networks were larger than the Armenian dealers who have to date been of primary interest to Islamic art market studies, which tends to focus on courtly objects highlighted in exhibitions of Islamic art today. Yet, thousands of sherds and shards, repaired ceramics, and textiles of modern manufacture that flooded the market for Islamic art in the late 19th century are still kept in museum storage. This story is about one such common object, a specimen as it might've been called. Excavators, artisans, buyers, manufacturers, and financiers who lived in and traveled between Istanbul, Cairo, London, Manchester, Paris, New York, and other localities were as significant, if less visible, than the dealers whose names occasionally surface in provenance records. Expanding our viewfinder to consider this wider network reveals that these networks were not close, but rather porous, particularly for ethnic minorities. Julia Phillips Cohen has shown that from the Tanzimat period to the end of empire, Jewish Ottomans fashioned themselves as imperial citizens. I would like to suggest that in addition to internal cultures of trust, the projection of a shared imperial identity knit together these ethnic minorities in the transnational market for Islamic art and antiquities, even when ethno-religious differences were strategically emphasized. The carpet first came to the attention of museum professionals at the Met through Robert S. Pardo, an Ottoman Jewish dealer who served as the face of the Oriental Museum. A two-story Istanbul Antiquities Emporium come carpet workshop located just outside the Grand Bazaar. Pardo, who at times calls himself the manager of the Oriental Museum and at other times the director, is favorably mentioned in travel accounts from the period that stress Pardo's homegrown expertise. He repeatedly explains to clients that he does not possess the quote, scientific knowledge of the specialist, end quote. Instead, his learning was achieved as quote, a whimsical boy absorbed in mosque who in love with oriental antiquities had joined a caravan on its way to Mecca, end quote. In other words, Pardo, a Jewish Ottoman, emphasizes his localized knowledge and claims of expertise based on a natural relationship to the Muslim world, to the mosque and Mecca. When Pardo arrives in New York in 1905 with the rug seen here, American Carpet and Upholstery Journal reports that a very high authority on Oriental rugs is now in the city. On November 20th, 1905, he writes a letter on Waldorf Astoria stationery to Met director, Sir Caspar Purden Clark, stating that he wishes to offer a rug as a loan exhibit. Exercising his reputation as an expert, he claims that the rug is quote, the highest class among ancient Persian rugs and should be of great interest to the museum. He drops a photograph like the one you see here into the envelope and sends the letter uptown. Pardo appears to have brought the rug into the museum for inspection, given that the next documented transaction is the issuing of a loan receipt. The receipt records a Persian rug, 16th century, 
with Quran inscriptions and gold letters called the Abdul Qadar. This identification is taken from a typed eight page description with translations provided by Pardo. In that document, Pardo identifies the textile as the tomb cover rug from the shrine in Baghdad of the 11th century Sufi Sheikh Abdul Al Qadar Al Jalani. Pardo claims the legitimacy of both the rug and his own expertise through this document. He provides a provenance chain that begins with the founder of the Safavid dynasty and ends with, as he terms it, a bona fide descendant of the Grand Vizier to Suleiman the Magnificent. This transfer in ownership transforms a holy relic into a family heirloom, to use Pardo's own words. Now, through Pardo's, Pardo's intermediary activity, it becomes a celebrated piece on par with the famed article rug at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. This narrative, along with the Arabic to English translation signed R.S. Pardo, Constantinople, enables the Ottoman Jewish dealer to lay claim to specialized access and knowledge as a local Ottoman expert. But he is also strategic to distance himself from the rug's prior custodians, the Muslim. Here, as elsewhere, Pardo draws credibility from his status as an Ottoman and a non-Muslim. Letters from other Ottoman actors describe the rug with slight variations, causing its identification and authenticity, the value systems of the museum, to scintillate and fade. Similarly, through correspondence with the monolithic museum, the various nodes in the Ottoman network, each individual historical actor, becomes more visible as their entanglements are gradually hidden. Two years after the rug is put on view, another letter arrives from the Ottoman Empire. It is addressed to the manager of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and signed R.S. Pardo, opposite Para Palace Para Constantinople. There are several important inconsistencies to note here. First, this is not Pardo's hand. Second, in contrast to the dealer's earlier description associating the rug with Abdul al Qadar al Jalani, here the author re references a Spahan rug with Quran inscriptions and gold thread. Stating that the Oriental Museum is now in liquidation, the author of the letter asked that the museum keep the rug and, quote, not deliver it to anyone without my special or authorization, end quote. One month later, another letter arrives at the Met. It is signed by Krikor Gamush Gerdan, a Manchester-based shipping merchant and written on the, letter hand of o, the letterhead of O. Agopian and Son, a transnational Armenian shipping and banking firm. It states that Agopian has taken over as trustees of the Oriental Museum and asserts that Pardo no longer has a right to the rug. This must be the specter alluded to in Pardo's letter. But what the Met could not have known is that Agopian and Pardo were not strangers. They had been partners from the founding of the Oriental Museum in 1895. Given the available documentation, it is difficult and perhaps impossible to ascertain the organization of the Oriental Museum and how the business relationship between O. Agopian and Son and the Oriental Museum may have changed. What is clear is that the 13 year business relationship between the two Ottoman intermediaries was selectively concealed from the Met. More letters are exchanged and two more parties enter the conversation. The first, Saragan S. Kent Kostikian is an Ottoman Armenian who migrated to the United States in the 1880s and opened a storefront in Chicago he called Bazaar Asiatic, a name rather similar to Pardo's Oriental Museum. That store closed around the time of the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. Kostikian then moved to New York, where his client services expanded to include carpet storage and insurance. In his letter to Casper Pardon Clark, director of the Met, Kostikian writes that the Oriental Museum requests that he carry an insurance policy on a quote, small antique rug. To accurately insure the rug, he wants to know whether the rug is on view and for sale or in storage. Clark responds that the rug has recently been withdrawn from exhibition in preparation for a new Oriental room. He also informs Kostikian that Pardo and Agopian are in disagreement about who owns the rug 
and that the Met will retain the rug until both parties reach accord. At the time of this episode with the Met, Ken Kostikian was in a period of transition. The main gallery moved to Midtown, which was quickly becoming the center of the New York art world. The firm was also, paradoxically, liquidating its stock at the short-lived Gallery of Foreign Arts in Washington, D.C., where Kostikian was a partner. According to an advertisement in the Washington Post, the sale was out of necessity, owing to, quote, the suspension of their foreign bankers, end quote. Could Kostikian's banker have been O. Agopian and son? A few months later, in November 1908, the New York dry goods store, James McCreary & Co., held a, quote, unusual sale of oriental rugs, formerly the property of O. Agopian and Son. Late bakers and rug merchants of Constantinople received from the trustee in liquidation, end quote. Here again, Ottoman actors become visible, not as competitors as they likely appear to the Met, but rather as long-term strategic business partners. The next node in the Ottoman network is a Greek man by the name of Albert Yanni, who claims to have repaired a substantial portion of the rug. He asks, given the restoration of the rug, does the Met consider it authentic or fake? Ernesto Robinson, acting director of the Met, replies to Yanni, explaining that the question of authenticity rests on the intention of the restorer. Robinson says that he personally inspected the rug and determined that although the work was skillful, it is clear which parts of the rug are not original. Therefore, it remains authentic. The tug of war over legitimacy and expertise surfaces in other parts of Yanni's letter, where the Ottoman Greek artisan refers to a quote, countryman of mine living in New York and another rug in the possession of a Turk, end quote. Like Pardo, Yanni builds credibility through self-identification with the Ottoman Empire, but differentiates himself from the Turkish Muslim, parodied and scorned in American popular culture. The controversy around the rug's ownership quiets down until spring 1910, when yet another Ottoman actor enters the scene. Ed S. Bagian, whose letterhead designates him the director of La Galerie d'Art Orientale, at the, same entrance, at the same address of Pardo's Oriental Museum, claims to have purchased the entire stock from the liquidation of O. Agopian and Son, including, quote, the small antique rug, the small antique Persian rug exhibited since 1905, end quote. To clarify and prove his credibility, Begion includes in his letter the photograph that I've been showing on these slides. As you can see, it is inscribed on the back property of Mr. Ed S. Begian, antiquarian, Stamboul, Constantinople. Begian asks if the Met will buy it for $16,000, the equivalent of nearly half a million dollars today. Someone at the Met must have been interested in the rug because an acquisition recommendation is drafted. Here, the rug regains Pardo's designation as the Abdul Qadr. The recommendation is, re is referred to Wilhelm Valentiner, curator of decorative arts, but declined. The procedure to return the rug should follow, but O. Agopian and Son is not yet out of the picture. Gumush Gerdan again writes to the Met, asking the museum to once more change the ownership of the rug, not to Begian, but to a Mrs. Erahuni O. Agopian who is reportedly in possession of the original loan receipt. At this point, Met leadership seeks legal help. At first, the recommendation is as follows. The only safe course for the museum is to require a satisfactory bond of indemnity and the delivery back to the museum of the original receipt given to Pardo. The loan receipt does not materialize, but Begion sends a letter written by Erahuni Agopian requesting that the Met, quote, hold the rug at the disposal of Begian, end quote. Agopian's signature is notarized by the British Consul General and verified by the U.S. Consul General. With this state authorization, Begian requests the Met to send the rug to a shipping agent in Paris. Edward Robinson, now acting director of the Met, continues to seek legal advice and appears to grow increasingly frustrated. In December 1910, he writes that he has, quote, 
very anxious to have the matter disposed of as soon as can safely be done, both in justice to Mr. Begian and in our own interest, end quote. He seeks approval from Robert W. DeForest, a museum trustee and lawyer to send the rug to Begian. Despite DeForest's earlier recommendation that Robinson ask the Constantinople dealer if he has a local representative who could pick up the rug in person and thus assume responsibility for it. In a tone that betrays his prejudices, Robinson explains, another quote, I think it unlikely that a small Constantinople dealer would have such a representative in this city. It's still more unlikely that he would have one he, whom he would be willing to trust in a matter of this kind, such being the nature of Orientals, end quote. There is much to unpack in this quote, but for the purpose of this paper, it suffices to note that at the end of this five year long saga, the rug gains value while the Ottoman network remains opaque to the New York Museum. The rug is eventually returned to the Ottoman Empire. And though Pardo disappears from our story, his subject position as a mobile Ottoman affords him a second life in Paris where he reestablishes his gallery in the fashionable Right Bank Gallery District. Through this rather convoluted narrative about the intersection of a legal question about property and a transnational network of mobile Ottomans, I have attempted to demonstrate what is gained when art history and museum studies broaden their disciplinary lenses to consider people and objects that fall outside institutional definitions of tastemaker and treasure. It is my hope that this study can join the recent work of such Islamic art historians as Jessica Hallett and Alison Wharton Dugarian, who are expanding and complicating research on Ottoman Armenian art dealer networks, in part by investigating the embeddedness of these networks in larger social, cultural, and political contexts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the turn of the century, United States, the economy, business configurations, and broader social relations between people and things were deeply contested. Wharton Dugarian has recently argued that at the v &A in London, museum curators were suspicious of Ottoman Armenian art dealers because these foreign merchants, as they were disparagingly denominated, occupied an in-between ethnic status and developed business practices that relied on informal networks. I would like to suggest that although the lack of visibility that I have emphasized throughout this presentation was certainly cause for suspicion, in the context of the turn of the century United States, the informal networks of Ottoman Armenian art dealers were not de facto suspicious. Understanding informal networks to mean strategic webs of trusted personal relations, not regulated by the state, nor readily transparent to such institutional entities as the Met, I posit that Ottoman intermediaries operated not dissimilarly to Americans in other industries who gained market share by controlling information and building credit and credibility. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. That was a very interesting paper. I think three of our papers today really talked to each other. Uh, and in fact, it's very interesting that also chronologically we start in the, with the 1850s and come to uh, late 19th century and with Roxanne, we are ending with the early uh, 20th century. So um, I, I know I found that uh, really um, the papers really talk to each other uh, in that way as well. So let's uh, see if you have any questions from the audience or from our panelists. Uh, we have a question. Maybe you can come here to them. <laughs> and maybe I can move a bit here so they can see you as well. Yeah. Hi, Roxanne. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I actually wondered if uh, sort of we can uh, sort of track these uh, Armenian actors that you were talking about, sort of when I, I know that, uh, for instance, you said that they migrated in the 1880s, but were they naturalized as Armenian sort of as American citizens? Did they go back and forth? Did they migrate back and forth sort of like between 
uh, sort of uh, the Ottoman Empire and um, like North America, because I'm uh, like uh, actually asking these questions kind of um, because of like Goodman's, like David Goodman's like research on sort of Armenian like mobility and migration in the sort of uh, in the 1880s from 1880s onward. And then these like, you know, sophisticated smuggling networks that emerge and uh, sort of these Armenians who got, you know, naturalized sometimes like actually coming back to the Ottoman Empire and there being all of these like questions and like sort of problems actually that emerge between the, the US and, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, so I've, I was wondering if you could tell us anything about like that. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that question. And you're absolutely right. These actors really are quite mobile. They're moving between not only the US and at some, at some points the Ottoman Empire, but they're also moving to um, Western European capitals as well. So some of the actors I presented today are perhaps not the best case studies, um, but for example, the most, I guess, well-known case study would probably be uh, Dikran Kalekian, who is uh, sort of like the name in uh, Islamic art history when it comes to the a fulcrum of the Ottoman Armenian networks. And he certainly is naturalized as an American citizen. And he has galleries in Paris and he's traveling between Paris, Istanbul, Cairo, and London uh, quite frequently making at least, as far as I know, um, during the uh, 1890s and into up until the mid 1910s, he's making regular trips, perhaps annually to definitely Paris and also again to Istanbul and Cairo. Um, Ken Kostikian, who I also mentioned today, he is also he is um, also naturalized as an American citizen and is making very regular trips to the Ottoman Empire uh, during his entire lifetime. Um, as far as their sort of um, implication in some of these smuggling networks, I think that's definitely going on. They're, those networks are a little bit more difficult to entangle, but they're certainly moving in, in, these, in these circles. Um, but I would say it's sort of like a case-by-case -case basis. Do you know where like, you for... they originated from sort of in the Ottoman Empire? Were they from the Mamrat as Vilayat, for instance, Harput? Because that's like primarily where like Armenian migration was, you know, sort of taking place from to, to North America specifically. Mm -hmm. So most of the, as far as I understand, most of the Ottoman dealers who have been well identified are coming from, well, originally their families are coming from Kayseri. And then, but they had, many of them had sort of outposts in Istanbul before they made that final migration to, to, the, to the United States. So that tends to be a common origin point. Thank you so much. So our questions are coming. So um, Jeran Abi has a question to Nilay. Um, Nilay Jeran asks, I'm curious about the transportation and security aspects of moving all these treasures to Vienna. Would you say a few words about it? Um, thank you, Joran, for the question. Yes, we know a little bit about uh, how they transported it. They used the trainway, uh, the, the infamous Orient Express, uh, to send them to Vienna with a special train. And uh, we also have some correspondence in the archives stating that the, the goods, the treasury objects, has arrived to Vienna and they were secured in the um, Hofburg Palace uh, in, the, in the imperial treasury of the Habsburg dynasty. So they, they remain there uh, for a couple of months because, as I have mentioned, the, the opening of the uh, Sultan's treasury has delayed for uh, for several months, so they have to keep, keep it safe in, in the palace there. And also, Jeran um, master thesis gives us some information about uh, how they were protected, how they were received uh, in Vienna, uh, based on the, the articles on the Austrian press. So that's another source that I have used. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Nilay. I think this is a question to uh, Balinoja. Uh, by Neriman Ozer, I'm assuming. Uh, thank you, all speakers, for the rich and interesting information. Uh, I would like to ask if there was any clue regarding what caused the expected bribes in the exciting anecdotes she quoted. 
or could these be simple excuses to justify their actions? It is true that such events were irreparable misfortunes for people who spent efforts probably for many years uh, and even risked their lives to dig them out and arrange for transfers to some countries far away from where the objects belong. So maybe uh, I continue with the second question, I would like to answer this one. Uh, we can come to the second part. It is a long. <laughs> yeah, it's a very long. I can read it. On the other hand, can these events still be called misfortunes for the native inhabitants and real owners, owners of them? While the faraway museums filled with such big or small objects, hall after hall, are earning high revenues from tourists and researchers and not paying any royalty, etc., to the real owners. The human humanity owns a lot to the archaeologists, tradesmen, travelers of. Uh, older times for uncovering the ancient cultures, but it seems there were many downsides to it too. Thanks. Thank you, Nediman, uh, Hanum, for your question. Perhaps I can start with this <laughs> one, the first one, because the other one really uh, deserves a big uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I think there was a perception about the, the, uh, the, the necessity of bribe and the you know, the, the practice of uh, bribe back then, which kind of creeps into the, you know, uh, the literature, secondary literature uh, today as well. Uh, but that does not mean that it didn't happen. They, there might be some truth value to that. I mean, it might have been uh, working in that way as well. Uh, I don't know the specific reason uh, for the uh, for the uh, literature on uh, just this uh, repeated uh, 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 perception of, of the failure to uh, pay a uh, bribe. Uh, I mean, we know that Plus is very, uh, uh, very uh, laconic when he writes about it in his account, but I didn't have the chance to look at the, the, the letters that he had uh, written, which was published later. Uh, 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 by uh, Pierre, uh, there might be something in the letters that uh, he might be uh, insinuating or uh, saying that might have, that must be that might be the, the origin uh, of that. But in this particular case, uh, uh, what I was trying to give it is that there are other actually uh, issues <laughs> than just the, the, the general stereotypical. Uh, condemnation of the of the tribes and the uh, the bribe uh, practices. Um, about the second uh, part, I think this is um, this is exactly what I'm trying to uh, try not to counter, <laughs> uh, because the, the owners uh, of of um, of uh, antiquities, owners of uh, of uh, of artifacts, is uh, who I mean I did the. It's a big question, and I nowadays, of course, I think uh, there is a general tendency not to move the material that are found in archaeological excavations from the place that they are uh, found, which actually kind of the Russians uh, were uh, kind of doing uh, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. They had that idea of you know uh, uh, local uh, on-site museums as opposed to uh, your moving material. Uh, now we are in favor of that, but, in, but I mean, the, the homeland of the material and the, the real owners issue, I think, is a very tricky one. Uh, I don't want to really go into that. I think that is uh, that requires a, a big debate. Uh, so, uh, well, in a way, um, uh, I don't really know how to, I mean, how to really give a definitive answer to that. I think it is something that we need to really uh, discuss more uh, before deciding the ownership of, of uh, you know, archaeological uh, and other uh, artistic artifacts uh, uh, moving from their places to the uh, to, to museums. I mean, because it is, it's in the end, for instance, I talked about the Ottomans, who were kind of, you know, exploiting the material of the provinces uh, uh, that, uh, in order to take to, uh, to, uh, to Istanbul, which uh, most of the time they could not really uh, achieve. Uh, so I think this is a this is a question that requires a, <laughs> an extensive uh, thinking together without uh, without uh, uh, you know a very much. 
uh, boundary making between uh, nations and, and uh, local locality and the uh, you know other uh, global uh, locales. I don't know if this satisfies the the the, uh, the uh, uh, gives an answer to your uh, question, Mr. Uh, Reza. Thank you. Thank you, Bayvino Jam. Uh, I'll continue with another question to Roxanne, uh, asked by Jaren Abi again. Uh, Roxanne, Jaren asks, uh, what was the relationship between Ottoman Jewish and Ottoman Armenian networks? Thank you so much for that question as well. So this is actually something that I'm really trying to work out at the moment, but I don't think that the relationships were antagonistic. And I think this is a main um, point that I'm trying to really make in this research is that while these networks have traditionally been thought of as exclusively Armenian networks, when you, when you consider the various correspondence and wider business relationships between uh, various partners within these merchant, artisan, uh, financier networks, they are consisting of a whole sort of cast of who tend to be ethnic minorities from the Ottoman Empire, not exclusively Armenian or Jewish, though, or necessarily that those two networks were separate and coming together. I sort of see them as part of one network. Um, but I will say it's something that I'm very much still working out, and I'm very open to any kind of um, suggestions uh, from anyone in, in the audience uh, with regard to this, these kinds of relationships. Um, yeah, thank you. And I perhaps I can answer the, the next question that I see in the Q&A. Alirad uh, Yusuf Nia asks, um, thanks, I mean, he says, thanks for your fascinating presentation, Roxanne. I'm curious to know whether or not you come across Armenian Iran Iranian dealers and merchants within your research and the connection to the source of the production sites as you talk about the Iranian or so-called Persian carpets. It seems like the production sites were absent referent within the presentation. Thank you. So, thank you for your question as well. Uh, there's, there's a couple really interesting points that I would like to pull out from your question. The first is the, the so-called Persian carpet, as you call it. I think that's actually a really important way to sort of term these objects. There's this tendency in this time period to identify everything as Persian in uh, the United States and also in Western Europe more generally. Um, many scholars have talked about the uh, relationship between a uh, sort of Aryan culture or interest in Aryan civilization and the connection between um, the Persian world at this time period. So that is a really strong tendency, even when objects are have a very clear, let's say Ottoman provenance, they tend to be identified as Persian in this time period. Um, Manu Mo'alam has written a really interesting book about the commodification of the Persian carpet from the mid 19th century to the present, uh, which might clarify some of those questions. And with regards to your question about production sites, this is also something that I'm, I'm very interested in, but I also recognize is a little bit absent uh, in my current research. When it comes to some of the production sites, interestingly enough, uh, there's some production happening in these, um, in these uh, uh, galleries in the Ottoman Empire, for example. So uh, I showed a, a postcard from Pardo's Oriental Museum and it shows a woman at the loom and a major interest of travelers who visited Pardo's workshop was to comment on the presence of uh, typically young, what they identify as young Armenian girls uh, weaving at the looms, which, you know, there's a lot to unpack there, but there's production happening in the Ottoman Empire. And then certainly there's also production happening in Iran. Um, although that is a context that I'm, I'm still sort of, I'm working through. So thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, I mean, taking the privileged position of being the moderator, I would like to ask two questions to uh, Baygin Ocha and Nilay. My first question is to you, Baygin Ocha. I think you are very right in your conclusion to say that, you know, it's, it's as if everything started with Osman Hamdi, but we see with your presentation, already in the 1850s, uh, Ottoman officials kind of interrupted the uh, European uh, archaeologists uh, and they wanted to take the control in a way. 
uh, I'm interested in the vocabulary of these sources, like in the archives, what, how did they rationalize their interruption? Is it like they use our national sources? Or what was the reason for them to, uh, you know, keep the objects within the empire? I'm interested in the That's vocabulary. That's a very good question. Um, I, will, I didn't come across anything like um, our national sources. <laughs> this is a little bit early, so I don't think yeah. that there was that much talk about that. Uh, but I think there is a, there is a sense of entitlement mm -hmm. and also, uh, I mean, there are regulations mm -hmm. uh, and these people like Hilmi Pasha was mm -hmm. actually uh, kind of warned before in order to, you know, somehow, uh, you know, uh, bring stuff, you know, find stuff and send to the uh, to Istanbul. So uh, I think there was a sense of entitlement and ownership, mm -hmm. uh, but not in a very nationalistic sense mm -hmm. yet. I think that is there is there might be also kind of like a, a kind of imitative, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, position. Uh, but in the case of Ahmed Fitrusha that I uh, mentioned, uh, I know that uh, uh, he is kind of being discredited a bit, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my contention <laughs> is that uh, at least at the you know, level of intentions, uh, I mean, he did uh, quite a bit in terms of you know, regulating uh, the, the uh, activities uh, on the Ottoman lands back then. And I think as a consequence of that, uh, there, there was that, uh, you know, uh, attempt. So, but I don't, they don't, they don't really have that much vocabulary yet. Mm -hmm. So they are just very, uh, you know, descriptive yeah. uh, labeling, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like mm -hmm. it's, it's strange uh, and grand, uh, uh, you know, uh, he can. Uh, the, the terms like Asal, uh, uh, Asal, they, they would appear a little bit, Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a bit later, and they would come with the idea of a uh, side article. Mm -hmm. But at this point that I'm looking at, it is not there that much. It is mm -hmm. more like a descriptive uh, mm -hmm. uh, terminology. I yeah. don't know if that. No, no, no. It's. I mean, I think it would be interesting to compare this 1850s vocabulary, the way, the way how the the statesman like Hilmi Pasha rationalizes interruption than to people like Osman Hamdi or later to even Hagi Letambe. Uh, I think that it would be interesting to see the change in the way this kind of uh, vocabulary changed towards their entitlement towards the um, archaeological objects and so forth. Much more, of course, much more yeah. knowledgeable uh, uh, approach is at issue in, in the case of uh, uh, Osman Hamdi, but still I think there was, you know, yeah. Uh, at the level of intentions, I think there were uh, really, there was an attempt. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, we have talked about it, of course, I'm looking at the, the documents in the Ottoman archives and usually the, the, the language is not really very, uh, you know, uh, is not something that we can really see the nuances and yeah. differences that much apart from, you know, some, uh, you know, emerging new uh, uh, terms. Uh, so yeah, I think there was uh, there was a sense of entitlement and mm -hmm. just coming to grips with this new reality of you know of Jessim uh, Tashlaj. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Jessim Tashlaj. Thank you. And um, before I take the question to Roxanne uh, Nilay, I would like to ask you a question. Um, you talk about the return of the treasury from the. 1873 Vienna exhibition back to the top of the palace and you talk about uh, kind of touristic visits to, to the treasury uh, and can you talk about this kind of uh, in terms of practice how did it happen how did people Europeans or locals uh, see these collections in the top of the palace well, um, after the initial circulation of the treasury, first in the Sergi Umumi in Istanbul and then sending them to Vienna, they came back to the Topkop Palace, of course. And the practice of displaying them had already started by the mid 19th century. But by the time of Abdulhamid II, all this display became 
so much standardized. It became almost a, a choreographed tour, you know, where they they um, they have a performance of showing all these um, pavilions and gardens and kiosks of the of the palace and uh, hosting the visitors, which ended up at the at the treasury, which was also another sort of performance as well. So the the objects were back in the palace, but the, the circulation and mobility of the people continues. It became an attraction point uh, for the visitors. But up until the second constitutional era, it was only open for the Western tourists, I mean, Americans and Europeans. Uh, in the records, I don't see any uh, Muslim travelers. Maybe that's because they are not interested or maybe they were not allowed, but we see lots of Europeans and Americans visiting the Topka Palace and the Imperial Treasury. And only after the second constitutional era, um, the, the, the locals were, were admitted to the palace and it, it became a huge attraction point, like thousands just pour in the Topka Palace to visit the treasury, but it's a, it's a long story. So thanks for bringing this up, Isa. Thank you, Nilay. And um, Roxanne, we have a question to you again, this time from one of our panelists, um, Vaskan Davidian. He says, thanks again for three brilliant presentations. I believe you can see his question as well from the chat, Roxanne, but I'm reading loud just in case. My question is to Roxanne. When looking at the Kostik, uh, Kostikians, did you come across their trade in paintings? For example, the Castilian Ferrets were responsible for selling Shaul Nishanyan's painting in the US. Also regarding uh, Beguyan, Beguyan and Ottoman citizen, uh, who was a student of Rodin, also exhibited a piece of sculpture at the 1900 Paris Exposition. Might this be the same person? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know, actually, this is a new reference for me, so I'm extremely appreciative of, of you sharing this. Um, it's, well, actually, I don't think this is the same person because there, there's a larger Beguan family, which is not Beguan. Um, I know of some Beguans who could be from the same family of the S Beguan. I, I don't know that name in particular, um, but there are, were other Beguans who, for example, were very active in the trade of um, other kinds of textiles, in particular uh, Ottoman velvets. And Amanda Phillips has written a little bit about that. Actually, she's written a lot about that. Um, but I don't think Beguan is the same as Begian, which is a little bit of a I'm still learning about him. I believe that he may have migrated to London, in fact, in the 1930s. There's an E. Begian who appears um, in some of the uh, British publications in the 1930s and who also lends to the um, 1931 uh, exhibition of Persian art at Burlington House. But I think that that may be a different, a different actor. Um, but these are all wonderful references, and I'm sorry I, I can't answer your question really, but I appreciate you raising them to my attention. Uh, I think we're going to end in two minutes, but I would like to take this opportunity. Oh, there's a question, I think, is it? Um, I think that's a comment. I would like to comment maybe, Roxanne, it was really a brilliant paper. You kind of changed the focus from the collectors, the museum, to the dealers. Um, and I mean, I will comment, it won't be a question, but um, as I'm working on the First World War, I come across Salil Etambe's writing and complaining about the fact that Ottoman carpets became so popular and expensive recently in Europe, and we are losing our own carpets kind of uh, language. Uh, and if, if you're interested, I'm happy to share them with you. He published them, if I'm not wrong, in Yeni Medva in 1918. So kind of just, you know, um, one decade after uh, what was happening at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, it kind of, uh, you know, it's a kind of a response by the Ottoman authorities to the rising popularity of Ottoman uh, Islamic uh, arts objects in Europe. So if there's no uh, question coming, um, I would like to, I mean, if you want to say anything, Roxanne, sorry, I kind of stop you, please. Uh, sorry if you would like to add anything. No, that's right. I was just going to say thank you so much and I'll, I'll certainly follow up with you.
Yeah, definitely. Lovely. It's a pleasure to meet you. So if there's no other question, I'm going to end this panel and I would like to thank our panelists for these brilliant, fascinating papers. Um, and I think and also thank you, uh, the audience, for your great questions. So we have a 15 minute break and we will start at 6 p.m. Ankara time, Istanbul time. Uh, and uh, we will be there in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.